All right, welcome. We have a special program coming up on grizzly bears. This is grizzly country, you know. The football team across the street. <laughs> but we're much more than that. It's got to be the best mascot name in America, the Grizzlies. All right, well, first we're going to start out with my land acknowledgement, which is a little different from what you hear once in a while. Today, we join together in what we call the Missoula Valley to acknowledge and honor the land on which we stand. Previously known by its original Salish Quilesp inhabitants as the place of the small bull trout along the beautiful Clark Fork and Bitterroot Rivers. They were traditionally called the Freezing Waters or Red Osier Dogwood. We would like to honor the ancestral stewards of this land, the Bitterroot Salish, the Ponderé, Northern Shoshone, and Nez Perce peoples, and all their descendants. We are now recognizing that these people took incredible care of these lands over the millennia. The past 200 years brought experiences that were not always beneficial for the flora or the fauna. These are lessons we can carry forward to build a better future for our children and our children's children. Lessons of respect for our land, the animals, and all people. This is my little addendum. If we were to compress the last 10,000 years of indigenous existence into a single 24-hour day, Lewis and Clark would have shown up at about 1130. So you do the math. Indigenous people here, 23 and a half hours. All the rest of us, about 30 minutes. That kind of puts it in perspective for a lot of us. So. With that, I'm going to introduce our speaker today, uh, Mr. Rob Cheney, who is the uh, uh, editor of the local newspaper here, The Missoulian. And Rob grew up in Missoula, and he's been writing about Montana and the Rocky Mountain West for his whole career. After completing a bachelor's degree in political science at McAllister College, he worked for the Hungry Horse News up north by Glacier, the Bozeman da Daily Chronicle, and numerous freelance opportunities before becoming a staff writer at the Missoulian in 1997. There he covered local government, education, business, public safety, and the great outdoors until he became the managing editor in 2022. At that time, he made reporting connections between Montana and China, Nepal, Jamaica, Brazil, Japan, Poland, and Canada. In 2020, he received the Neiman Science Journalism Fellowship at Harvard, that's again, Harvard University in Boston, yeah. He's also an author of the book, The Grizzly in the Driveway, and I, uh, shamelessly say that it's a great book to read and it's a ball about us living with the grizzly today and if I, I don't know where all you folks are from all over the country obviously but every time you open up the Missouli and I'm gonna say at least two or three times a week you'll see a headline that appears on grizzlies so it's a big topic around here and Rob has really been the leader in presenting that to the to the local people. Rob doesn't know this, but during COVID, I attended some of his classes in adult learning. But I was on the other end, so he's never seen me before. <laughs> so anyway, with that, I'd like to introduce to you, ladies and gentlemen, Rob Cheney. far kinder than it needed to be, but thank you. <laughs> this thing seems really loud if it's uh, too booming. I'll, okay. <laughs> well, first of all, um, thank you for the invitation. 
thank you for coming to uh, this part of the talk. Um, I have no doubt that everybody in this room knows a heck of a lot more about Lewis and Clark than I do. But I have spent a little bit of time uh, looking at bears and people in this part of the world, and Lewis and Clark do have a pretty influential uh, bit of spin on that ball, so hopefully we will have a pretty good place to, to meet in the middle about um, where bears go from here with us, because that's way more interesting to me than arguing about the past history is what are we going to do about our future knowing what we have known and doing what we've done with our fellow planetary species. Um, Lewis and Clark, as I'm sure you all have had lots of fun with, were adventurous spellers. Um, but a most tremendous looking animal and extremely hard to kill sums up their experience with it pretty well in a, a single sentence. Um, I think I'm sure some of you have probably read a number of scholarly papers specifically about Lewis and Clark and the bears. Um, so I'll just kind of rush over a little bit of that. But while they were probably the most extensive uh, what I will call American white chroniclers of, of bear activity up to that point. There's a fair amount of bear record um, going before that. The first written records that I've been able to find go back to uh, 1602, uh, when some Spanish explorers along the California coast reported seeing grizzly bears dancing on whales that were beached along the Monterey coast uh, and eating them. And uh, in, in conversation beforehand here with uh, Galen, our VISTA volunteer, um, who used to work at the Monterey, is it the Mo Monterey State Historic Park and knows a whole lot more about this than I do, uh, there, there's a lot of accounts of people running into grizzly bears up and down the California coast. <laughs> Uh, and all the way up the coastline to Alaska. Um, and if I heard you right, grizzly bears, um, Ursus arctos, are a uh, global species. And there's a bunch of subspecies of them that are kind of determined by their, uh, by their habitat. The coastal bears, uh, we know best as the Kodiak, uh, the ones that you see every spring feeding on the salmon that come into uh, along Kodiak Island and various other inlets on the Alaska coast. And they're the great big ones. Um, they're great big mainly because they got an incredible food source to play with. It's not necessarily that they were, you know, genetically uh, different than the bears here in Montana, which are about half that size. But those salmon runs extended all the way down the California coast, and so did those bears, which is a kind of a decisive thing. Grizzly bears are kind of like a Tyrannosaurus rex. They're the biggest, baddest thing with itty-bitty arms. <laughs> and they are way more opportunistic than they are purely predatory. So for example, a mountain lion is exclusively carnivorous. It is the only animal on this continent that can take out another animal nine times its size. A 120-pound mountain lion can take out an 800-pound elk. Um, grizzly bears, on the other hand, tend to put themselves in places where the food comes to them. And in Lewis and Clark's case, that was the river valleys, which Lewis and Clark were using as their main mode of transportation, so they were all in grizzly country from the minute they crossed the 100th meridian around the Montana-North Dakota line and started running into bears. So their first account is, uh, uh, what was it here, April, um, April 1805, they started seeing tracks in the mud along the Missouri River along bison carcasses that were dinner plate sized and wondered what the heck was that. And they asked their Minotauri Indian uh, guides and hosts for uh, 
background and were informed that, yeah, that was, that was the bear, the silver bear. That was the thing that they only went after in war parties of uh, six to 10 or 12 warriors and almost exclusively for uh, sacri sacramental purposes. Just about nobody in the continental United States hunted grizzly bears for food. Um, they had a whole range of roles in their cosmology um, as a sacred animal, as an intercessor, as a um, sometimes the, the flat out uh, chief god or head of the gods. A number of the tribes around here um, had the grizzly and the eagle as sort of the co-chairs of the, of the, uh, the people, or excuse me, the persons, the animal persons who came before the human people and worked everything out before uh, the people showed up and then would, would guide them. The grizzly, interestingly enough, especially in Montana, is all over the map for personality. He is the great wise sage. He is the obnoxious jerk. He is the greedy bastard. He is the giving teacher. He, he or she is the, the nurturing uh, teacher and, and mentor of both young men and young women. Um, the, the range of personalities contained within that one character, as far as I've been able to tell, is just about endless. Um, which tells you a lot about the grizzly's role in the world. Well, Lewis and Clark's role with them was to catalog and, you know, record everything that was out here and what uh, people would need to know as, as settlers moved into this territory. And what they basically decided was the grizzly was a threat and something of a challenge and at least in my readings of, of the journals and, and of other peoples who've been a lot more detailed on them, they kind of went after dang near every bear they saw. Um, the, the count on the Western trip was 23 grizzlies killed. Um, and here's what I mean by uh, they're a habitat-based, food-based operation. Um, they were, Lewis and Clark were running into grizzlies all the way across eastern and central Montana until they hit the mountains. Their last grizzly on the westward trip, they ran into around three forks, and then the grizzly disappears from the record all the way across to the Oregon coast, although there were bears in the mountains and there were bears on the coast. All the way back, they don't run into them again until they get to uh, the Clearwater River area of Idaho. Uh, where they shoot six more. And then as they work their way across Montana, they shoot another 14. Um, and I emphasize the shooting because I don't really, they don't really have much of an account of why they needed more bears or that the bears were raiding their camp or otherwise threatening them. They just seem to kind of be a target of opportunity and challenge. And I think that's significant because what happened after that was exclusively an opportunity of target and challenge regarding us and the bears. Um, when Lewis and Clark came out, they were really familiar with the black bear, which was a totally different personality as far as what you had to do when one showed up in your neighborhood. Black bears are highly vegetarian. They are pesky. They're brave, they're willing to come in and steal your chickens or whatnot, but they're not going to fight people or dogs for that matter, for the most part. Um, and they're not much of a, of a issue other than to be a pest. The grizzly, twice to three times as big, very territorial, very definitely willing to fight you about just about anything that you would care to put on the table. Um, whole different animal and fairly concentrated in the places that people really wanted to be. The river bottoms, the river corridors, the riparian areas that were the most lush, uh, best farmland. Because grizzlies, for all of their ferocity, are also largely vegetarian. Um, 
it depends a little bit on where exactly they are, but studies that we have done between uh, Yellowstone, uh, the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, and the Northern Continental Divide Ecosystem, which is the mountains from Glacier Park down about to Missoula along the Continental Divide. The, uh, the Yellowstone Bears diet um, is, I th if I remember right, about 60% meat, uh, give or take. The Northern Continental Divide Bears diet is almost 90% veg. And that has to do with what they have available to work with. There's an awful lot more game packed into the confines of Yellowstone National Park that the bears get to play with. Whereas up in the uh, Continental Divide um, Rocky Mountain Front, they're way more looking at uh, dandelions and huckleberries and yarrow and bitterroot and, and uh, stuff like that uh, since we wiped out the salmon runs. So, you know, they're vegan. What do you know? <laughs> um, they're also kind of hard to identify. Um, anybody want to guess what that is? Nice uh, silvery coat. That is actually a black bear cub about the size of a mid-sized poodle. Um, it's fairly easy to mix them up at, at distance and, and range. Um, but when you get into their territory, uh, you can very definitely tell the difference when you're up close. And this is their territory. This was their territory. So pre-Lewis and Clark, they were all the way down into Texas. There are accounts of grizzlies in Mexico, um, all up and down the, uh, the coast here. And pretty much only the central desert, um, the Great Basin, was too dry and too uh, um, vacant of, of either game or vegetation for them to do very well. And then as we started uh, settling the West, particularly as the uh, livestock industry got rolling, this area just progressively shrunk faster and faster. And it had mainly to do with us, um, us taxpayers paying for a government service that went around all of the um, livestock prone areas of the Western United States and poisoning virtually every predator on the landscape. There were, we hired guys with sack loads of, of uh, jerky laced with strychnine to just go up and down the prairies and wipe out every wolf, mountain lion, grizzly bear, fox, anything else that happened to get into that meat. In fact, uh, strychnine is so nasty and so long lived that a number of people recounted their horses dying if they grazed on a spot where a wolf had vomited while dying of strychnine poisoning. They could get it secondarily through grazing on the grass. The stuff is nasty. <laughs> and we did a very thorough job of taking about 50,000 grizzly bears that used to inhabit just this area and knocking them down to less than 1,000 by 1960. That's when, uh, for those of you in Missoula, uh, who have been here a long time, may be familiar with the Craighead brothers. Started really paying attention to grizzly bears and started uh, a technological revolution. The Craigheads were the first folks to actively and effectively use radio collars. I can't remember the guy who originally invented the thing, but he hung it on a marmot. And the next step up was the grizzly. <laughs> um, and the Craigheads, who were, uh, John in particular was based right here in, in Missoula at the University of Montana, uh, but they did most of their work in Yellowstone, and they uh, really pioneered the technique of both capturing bears and then figuring out how to, how to get a collar that would stay on a bear. At the time, all the collar could do was go beep, and if the bear laid down on it, it didn't even do that. There are a number of accounts of the Craigheads trying to find one of their bears and wandering around with their uh, receiver and just about tripping over the bear because it was snoozing in a bush, laying on the, on the beeper. 
well, now we all carry in our pockets more computing power than Neil Armstrong had to beep his way to the moon. And what do we do? We watch bear videos with it. <laughs> but the Craigheads, um, <laughs> their, their timing was interesting. They were in the early 60s. They set up shop in Yellowstone, worked like crazy. At that time, 1967, uh, a lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Aldo Leopold. Uh, his son, Starker Leopold, got the job from the federal government to reassess how the National Park Service was working uh, managing its natural areas. And it, the Starker Commission, as it was known, came to the conclusion that we were kind of nature faking our way through national parks. And they particularly got concerned with the Craigheads and their collared bears with ear tags because at the time the beeps couldn't even give you a, a identifier. So they had multicolored ear tags in the bear's ears. And the Starker folks said that is too unnatural. Um, we need all of this stuff removed. Right at the time, the Craigheads were saying, um, yeah, it's too unnatural because they're all feeding in the dumps. Uh, and you've built bleachers around the dumps to uh, let the tourists out after dinner and spotlight the bears as they come in to finish off the bacon grease. This is not good. As they are fighting, um, 1967, we have what everybody now knows as the Night of the Grizzlies. And that was the night in Glacier National Park where two separate grizzlies in two separate campgrounds kill two separate women on the same night. And I actually worked for a guy when I was a boat captain in Glacier Park um, who was boat captaining then and remembers the chaos at Lake McDonald as all the rangers are running around. We got to get up to the campground to get the girl. Which campground? Which girl? What do you mean? No, Granite Park? No, uh, Arrow Lake, uh, Trout Lake. These are eight miles apart and, and several ra creek drainages and we're all very confused. And no, actually, we had a black swan event um, which fed right into the uh, what do we do about bears question. And what the National Park Service decided to do was cold turkey shut down the dumps. And the Craighead brothers said, please do not do that. We need to have a more modulated system because you have got the bears so accustomed to this. Um, if you just turn them off, they're going to go look for food somewhere. They did. <laughs> And that uh, 960 number in 1960 went down to an estimated somewhere between maybe 300, maybe 160 grizzly bears in the space between about 1968 and 1970. Um, it was just a slaughter as bears were coming into every campground, knocking holes in every camper, just desperately looking for food that they used to be able to depend on from all the dumps that we had got them accustomed to. 1973, we get the Endangered Species Act. 1975, the grizzly bear becomes the eighth critter to get listed on the Endangered Species Act as a threatened animal. Um, but what kind of an animal is it? You know, we all have our teddy bears, the great story of, of Teddy Roosevelt and, uh, you know, I will not kill this bear. Um, the, the actual story is not nearly as, as pleasant, unfortunately. Um, he was looking for a particular kind of bear, a species of black bear, by the way, on a hunting trip, and his guide was unable to find him one until after searching for days, uh, he finally found a orphaned cub of this subspecies of black bear, captured it, tied it to a tree, and told Teddy where it was. <laughs> Um, Teddy came, looked at it, and said, this is not satisfactory, I'm not killing that. You kill it. So the guy killed it with a knife. <laughs> Sorry to pop the historic bubble, but um, the, the how, how does it go in uh, Who Shot Liberty Valance when, when uh, truth meets legend, print the legend? Um, so, so we wound up with this love-hate relationship with bears. 
And, and a lot of it, um, I really think, kind of stems from that early time with Lewis and Clark just seeing this as a challenge to be met, seeing this as a technological test of, you know, can I get a gun big enough that repeats fast enough? Can I be tricky enough? Can I find a poison or a, or a other method that um, can prove my worthiness against the biggest challenge uh, on the continent. Ernest Hemingway was a, uh, a real chaser of bears. Um, he uh, sacrificed his own favorite horse when it was uh, too lame to keep carrying him. He took it up into the Beartooth Mountains, shot it in the head for a uh, bear bait, and then uh, waited for a bear to come and, and uh, made a rug out of it. Um, the challenge, though, the bigger challenge, the bigger issue, is that grizzly bears are the slowest reproducing mammal in North America, and one of the slowest on the planet. They can be, as a demographic population species, destabilized and eliminated within a decade or less if you start seriously pushing on their population, as we very nearly did between 67 and 70, um, when we just about wiped them out of North America. This is a big concern when we get to now, when since 1975 we've been working like crazy, and again, we, we taxpayers, um, have been supporting the Interagency Grizzly Committee and its efforts to bring grizzly bears back. Now where they've been working, this is the, it's a little bit hard to see in the bright lights here, but the Northern Continental Divide is in blue, Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. And this is uh, about 8,900 square miles. And it's right now got, give or take, about 1,000 grizzly bears. The greater Yellowstone ecosystem right here is about, um, I wrote this all down, 9,200 square miles. It has got somewhere between 750 and 1,000 grizzly bears, depending on whose count you believe. And then you've got this area, this is the Cabinet Yak ecosystem, and the Selkirk ecosystem, and the North Cascades ecosystem. These three combined have about 14,000 square miles and about 120 grizzly bears. Um, of those, maybe 50 are in here, maybe 50 are in here, and virtually none are in here. Both uh, the North Cascades and the Selkirk have a, a demographic issue that since they're on the border, and they both have international relations with Canadian wildlife officials. Um, the Americans keep counting Canadian bears that come across the line. The Canadians keep counting American bears that come across the line. Um, nobody's really certain whose passport's carrying whom. Uh, but the result is in, in uh, North Cascades, um, they have no documented grizzly bears there for at least the last couple of decades. They've had an estimated five show up and leave tracks, but they think they're all Canadians. The Canadians think that they've got at least five, but they're all Americans. Um, and we're about to start a reintroduction program uh, to transplant grizzlies into the North Cascades. Uh, but then you've got this area, the Bitterroot, the Selway Bitterroot. This is about 5,000, uh, what is it, um, 5,800 uh, square miles. But if you know your Idaho, you know that around this is a whole bunch of the biggest uh, collection of wilderness areas and inventoried roadless areas left in the United States, all told roughly 25,000 square miles. That's big enough to lose West Virginia. It has no resident grizzly bears. It should have all the bears. This area was one of the most productive grizzly bear areas, and can anybody guess why? Even though it's the mountains? What's the guess? 
Mining? No, grizzly bears don't mine. <laughs> salmon. This was the tail end of some of the most productive inland salmon routes. Um, you can still find a salmon now. They are the most expensive salmon on the planet. They have to be trucked over several dams in order to get there, but they are now actually starting to spawn around the Lolo Pass area. But the, we used to have gigantic grizzly bear populations and gigantic bears in this area when it was still a fish producing territory. We pretty much wiped that out with the Snake River and Columbia River dams. And then we went through and extirpated the bears this is now about to start another version of uh, bear relocation. Uh, we nearly had it back around 2000. Um, it was all the way up to put them in the truck and drop them off. And then a change of administration between the Clinton and Bush administrations uh, put the plan on hold. Ironically, um, the, the folks who wanted to stop the plan screwed it up, they almost literally put the plan on a shelf. But that's not how you stop the government. In government, you actually have to pass legislation that says this plan is inactive, and they never did that. <laughs> so in, in pretty strong legal theory, somebody could go and pull that plan off the shelf and say, restarting. Um, instead, we are now working on a much more modern plan uh, to bring grizzlies back, and it's going to probably run through almost exactly the same dance steps as the uh, 1990s-2000 plan did, because grizzlies are still a dualistic creature. And that's where the title of this book comes from. Um, pro tip for all of you uh, potential book writers, uh, the author does not get to pick the title. <laughs> um, my, my title originally was going to be um, Waltzes with Bears, because I grew up listening to the Pea Green Boat, and blah, 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 Walter waltzing with bears was just kind of fun. And it seemed to be what we do a lot uh, in this dance step between the two species. But the uh, University of Washington Press folks decided that that was not acceptable, and so um, we were arguing back and forth about what it was going to be. And then, in 2019, in one particular week, a pair of fascinating incidents occurred. There was a bear that showed up outside of Browning, Montana, on the east side of Glacier Park, in somebody's driveway. And this somebody got very upset, because this bear was in her driveway, and then eventually under her child's trampoline in the backyard, and her child, very reasonably, did not want to ever go out in the yard again. And she was very upset because if a bear shows up in a campground in Glacier Park, the rangers swarm in and helicopters come flying and nets go everywhere and tranquilizer darts and the cracker shells and the whole dang works and that bear is out of there. But if a bear shows up in her driveway, it's her problem and she thought that was unfair. The same week, a bear showed up in a driveway in Condon, Montana, about 50-some air miles to the west. And this bear was also getting photographed and filmed in the driveway by people who named her Windfall. And they were posting all of their videos to Facebook and showing their grandchildren what a wonderful place they lived in because they have grizzly bears in the driveway. Isn't this cool? It was so cool that this grizzly bear named Windfall became habituated to garbage and became a problem bear and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks had to come up and kill her. And the community was so upset that uh, 27 of them wrote a letter to the general public apologizing for how they had screwed up and habituated this bear and caused her demise. And the marketing folks and I looked at this and said, that's our title, the grizzly in the driveway. Because in a bigger sense, what grizzly bears are is two very different things. They are an animal. They got four legs, they're a mammal, they're warm-blooded, they got claws, they eat this and that and the other thing, pretty much all of it. Um, but they are also a creature of our imagination. They are the boogeyman in the dark. They are the monster in the cave. 
They are the legal pawn on the chessboard in court that blocks certain actions from taking place and allows other actions to move forward. They are the policy driver that requires further investigation and the expense of tax dollars to determine if a logging project will or will not be detrimental to their existence. It is the question that you confront yourself with every time you decide to go and sit at a picnic table on Lake Alva and wonder if you need to have the bear spray next to the mosquito spray. Um, it's a creature of our imagination. And what we think about these bears, what we think about how much they affect our lives, is going to determine those bears' survival. And what we think about them is, uh, in scientific terms, asymmetrical. Let me give you an example. A couple of years ago, um, I was at a bear conference and the Livestock Association was presenting their figures for uh, grizzly depredations on the Rocky Mountain front. And they had lost 120 cows that year and that was a significant climb from years before. And they were very concerned that grizzly depredations were getting worse and worse. Again, I work in weeks. That same week, uh, we had got the report that a blizzard that winter had killed 11,000 cattle in north central Montana. 7,000 cattle in one county alone. Now, if you're an industry, and you've got a problem on this hand where you're losing 120 widgets and a problem on this side where you're losing 11,000 widgets, which is the problem you're going to deal with? Which is the problem that is going to command your attention and command everybody else's assistance and, and participation and tax dollars to resolve? I don't have an answer to that. I have my own opinions about how the math ought to work, but I am one person in a uh, democratic society where all of us have a vote and all of us pay taxes. But all of us do have to figure out what we want to do. And our time and our opportunity space is shrinking fast. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions I can. I think you put, you touch on it a little bit, but the American Prairie Project mm -hmm. out in the eastern part of Montana is buying up land trying to create this massive prairie. I know they've already introduced bison, which is tough enough out there to introduce. Do you think, do you know, is it part of the plan for the long range picture to maybe have bears out there? <laughs> um, as we noted at the beginning, uh, that's where grizzly bears belong. That is evolutionarily for the, for the Montana variation of grizzly bears, that's where they ought to be. Uh, politically, socially, can they be there? Um, American Prairie, I, I guess they had a presentation here earlier and, and I didn't get to hear it, so you're further up to speed on them than I am at the moment. But they're raising some really interesting discussions in Montana right now, the, the most fascinating of which is um, property rights. And what can a willing buyer do with a willing seller? Uh, which is winding up in court in some very unexpected directions where some of the people who are really opposed to American Prairie's activities are trying to tell other landowners that they can't sell their property to a willing buyer. Um, and that a willing buyer can't run their property as they see fit. Um, how that's going to play out is, you know, for, for courts and lobbyists and, and uh, people with a lot more money and, and stake in the game than I have to, uh, to resolve. But it does bring up some very foundational questions about how we run the landscape around here. And, you know, if American Prairie wanted to have a full bison ecosystem, then evolutionarily, they need some bears. 
I'm not saying that that's their plan. I'm not saying anybody has uh, proposed grabbing one, but I think there's a heck of a screenplay <laughs> in you know running around finding a captured bear in a culvert trap and driving it off to the Missouri River. Yes. So I guess my question is, and this uh, to restock grizzlies in the Bitterroot area where we have the headwaters, where was that were originally salmon spawning grounds? This has to be more salmon. Are the salmon returning in any significant numbers? I live in California. Forty years ago, I would go to California rivers, and each of the rivers in, in the fall were packed with salmon. Packed. You could walk on them. Now, there are virtually no salmon coming up those rivers. Is, is that, what, what's the status there, and could there be enough of a salmon run to support a grizzly population that would, say, primarily feed on salmon as opposed to huckleberries and, and, and roots? And, so. I, I highly doubt that. Um, you've got the, the Snake River dams uh, coming up from down here, which blocked the main access for salmon into this area. And then the Columbia River dams all through this area that used to bring salmon in. The Snake River dams are currently a political football. People are kicking around ideas in Congress about pulling them out. But even if they did, you're looking at decades of effort to try to restore. And I think there's a whole bunch of other dams in Oregon that are still in the way. Um, the, the idea that you would return to salmon that you could walk across uh, is highly unlikely. And the chances that we will take the Columbia River system apart, um, given the amount of agriculture and hydroelectric power and international relations tied up in that, I think is um, verging on zero. So I don't think those bears, even assuming that we put green lights up in all of those projects, would become fish-eating bears anymore. Yeah, in the back. I experienced uh, many years ago uh, being uh, hunting in uh, northern uh, Alberta, and they said that the, they had grizzlies there in northern Alberta. Yet, when you get in the Northwest Territories, they call them the Alaskan brown bear. That's the same bear, isn't it? So, the brown bear. Is, is the international term for Ursus actos. And that general species exists all around the planet above the equator. There are bears in Saudi Arabia, and Syria, and Japan, and Mongolia, and um, you know those guys at, uh, at uh, King Charles's coronation, what are the hats they wear? You know the really big ones? The bear skin hats. There used to be bears in, in Britain. Um, there are bears 50 miles outside of Rome in Italy. Uh, there are grizzlies all there. Are, it, it amuses me when you hear about people complaining about how many, there are too many grizzly bears in Montana. In Romania, you know, Montana has, um, depending on whether you count the Yellowstone bears, since they're technically mostly in Wyoming, uh, but let's, let's count them. We got 2,000 plus grizzly bears. Romania's got 7,000 grizzly bears. And they're mostly garbage bears, so they're in town all the time. And the Romanians seem to have figured out how to coexist with them without slaughter. Um, but all of those, to your point, are brown bears. And they vary in, in size and shape a little bit, largely depending on the kinds of food sources that they have. So especially the coastal bears, you get those Kodiaks that are a thousand plus. Um, the Continental Divide bears and the interior Alaskan bears tend to be um, smaller, unless they happen to be in an area where it's really productive for um, you know, working some kind of ungulate population or, or an inland fish opportunity or something. Well, the Native Americans up there were telling me that the rain, reindeer is where a lot of their food was. So those brown bears just across the line, they, as they call them brown bears instead of grizzly, they said they were as big as the grizzlies. Yeah. Yeah, it's also a, uh, um, a temperature-driven thing. 
uh, mammals as they get into colder and colder climates, this is a mathematical thing that I'm still struggling with because I'm a journalist, um, your, your ratio of, of skin surface area to body mass shrinks the larger you get, which is why it's really advantageous for um, northern climb animals to be much bigger than smaller, than uh, warmer climate areas. Um, there was a big controversy about, you know, when we reintroduced wolves that we were bringing down these giant Canadian timber wolves that were, you know, radically different than American traditional wolves. So the only difference was that, yeah, they, they were in a colder climate, they grew a little bit bigger um, because it was a, a minor evolutionary advantage, but it wasn't a strength thing, it was a heat thing. Um, so you, you have things like that going on that, that favor a larger bear and you don't need to be as big to be as as capable of surviving in a warmer place like this. Yes? Besides humans, what are the predators of the grizzlies? Pretty much nobody. Um, uh, gri grizzlies are really hard on each other. Um, the grizzly, uh, you know, the, the stories of, of uh, Yogi and Boo Boo, um, Boo Boo wouldn't make it. <laughs> gri gri grizzly fathers are hell on their kids. Um, and in fact, there, there's a word for it um, that I'm blocking on at the moment. But they will actively pursue the cubs of a female and kill them in order to get the female back into estrus and, and mate with her. Um, it, it's tough being a grizzly cub. Um, wolves and bears will go at each other um, over kills, but they will not opportunistically hunt each other. Um, pretty much nobody wants to eat a wolf or a bear um, as a fellow carnivore. Um, I haven't heard of bears and lions other than over a, a kill source, um, prey source, uh, and certainly not hunting each other. So we're pretty much it. Yes? Excuse my ignorance, but I'm just curious now. Are there, is there anywhere where polar bears and Kodiak bears are close to each other? Or? Polar bears what? Kodiak? 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 White polar bears and the grizzlies? There's a hybrids between the polar bears and the grizzlies. The pizzly. Yes, there are pizzly bears. Grizzlies and, and polar bears can uh, interbreed and there's a real interesting bunch of research going on because the habitat for polar bears is collapsing at an incredible rate. Um, they are really dependent on ice flows that allow them to work out into the water where they can go after seals and walruses and, and uh, other sea mammals. And if those ice flows aren't there, then the bears can't get out to where the where the seals are, um, and so they're trying to figure out how to eat something inland. I wonder, because I watched a documentary on that, the polar bears can't eat, so I wonder if they will come in down further south. A little bit. Would they be, would they be stubble, would, or they be such that they would be higher than the I don't know if they're mules. Um, I, just, I haven't seen the, the next step research on that, other than there are documented and named pizzly bears. If I was a bear, I would be annoyed. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I want to talk to the marketing department. <laughs> yes? So this is just a statement. In the Missoula airport, there is on display a great big grizzly. Yes, and I think if you read the fine print, that's almost certainly an Alaskan bear. Yeah, we have very few bears of that size left in Montana, and we stopped hunting them in 1990. Um, this is one of the last guys to, uh, not legally, but uh, um, unprosecutoridly, <laughs> kill a grizzly bear. Uh, his name is Leo Turner, and when I was working at the Hungry Horse News, the best named newspaper in the entire planet. <laughs> I got word um, that somebody had killed a grizzly bear with a knife. 
And nobody knew who it was, and Fish and Wildlife wasn't talking. And so my boss, Brian Kennedy, said, go find him. And so I went down to the Echo Lake area north of uh, Big Fork and just started asking around. And then one clue after another, yeah, 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 there was a bear killing. Yeah, there was this old crazy vet. Yeah, this, he's meaner than his dogs. And, and eventually I got to Leo's house. And Leo is not mean or crazy. Um, he does raise Rottweilers. And uh, one night he heard his dogs acting very strangely and he went out to see what was going on and saw something, this was his dog Pen, saw something in the pen. Couldn't tell what exactly it was until it jumped and collapsed the fence. And he ran back to his house and got his shotgun uh, came back out and got two shots off while jumping 12 feet backwards. The game warden who investigated the next day could find the, the holes of his, his shotgun shells and his footprints. He was telling me, he says, man, I got bronchitis. I'm a disabled Vietnam veteran. I didn't know I could jump that far backwards. <laughs> But uh, whatever it was disappeared in the dark, and he um, went back in. His gun had jammed. He went back into his house, and by this time, a neighbor came out, and his flashlight was dead, so they got more flashlights. And he came out um, with a 357 in his belt and a K-bar knife in his hand. And he went in the dark to figure out what went after his dogs, and he saw something move, and he jumped on it, and he stabbed it. It turned out to be a 500-pound grizzly bear. So he didn't know what it was when he jumped? He swears to me he had no idea what it was. He was so upset that he had killed a grizzly. He said it was the most beautiful animal he'd ever seen. And he was crying when he told me this. Uh, he was an A-team fighter in Vietnam. I didn't know that an A-team existed other than that silly TV show, you remember uh, Mr. T and the, I pity the fool. Um, and he pulls his A-team certificate off the wall and says, yeah, you know, that was my training. When you're after something in the dark, a knife is better than a gun. So he went after a grizzly in the dark with a knife and won. <sighs> Yes. Just a question. My husband and I have been traveling around in this part of the country before when we landed in Missoula and then we're back here. We drove by a town called Orofino. Mm -hmm. Okay? And there's a fish hatchery up there. Mm -hmm. Do they not stock salmon up there? Is that a place that, and what are they doing with those salmon or fish? Uh, that is mostly trout. Yeah. Yeah, we, we actually have a sockeye salmon uh, fishery, hatchery in Montana at Fort Peck, which is the reservoir in the northeast corner where we grow sockeye salmon of, of uh, ocean size. <laughs> a hell of a long way from the ocean, and they're never, ever going to see the ocean. Um, but restoring a, a functioning salmon run, um, it's happening. When they pulled the dams out of the Elwha River in uh, Washington, salmon started running back into there within years. Um, but that's a one dam plug of a salmon system. We're looking at multiple dams and, and century worth of, of damage. Where in Fort Peck do the salmon actually spawn? In a hatchery. Yeah, they are not, um, I, I'm fairly certain they are not doing live spawn at all. So they're being caught uh, and put in this hatchery area? Ra raised from captive eggs in the hatchery and then dumped into the reservoir. <coughs> Not really <laughs> Yeah. 
Folks, thank you very much. Thank you.